So tonight we're going to talk about refrigerant recovery. So let's take a look at some different things to do with refrigerant recovery. And what we're going to start out with here uh, is a basic system. We're going to talk about some foundational principles with re refrigerant recovery. And then we're going to make some changes to this and try to do several different things, show you different methods and ways to get the job done a little bit quicker. All right, now with refrigerant recovery, of course, one of the things we have to deal with as technicians is standards and regulations. Now these typically in the field come from three different places. We're looking at the EPA to do the 608. Uh, AHRI gives us guideline K and the DOT gives us 49 CFR. Now the DOT is specific to transportation. So that's when we put it in our trucks, we take these tanks and we transport them down the road. So they have some different rules than say guideline K and the EPA says when we need to recover and how much we can lose when we're recovering, things like that. So the intermesh of all three of those pieces, we have to figure that out. So we're gonna talk some about that as well and where we need to apply different things to that. Now, one of the big things when we talk about recovery, liquid versus vapor. When we're recovering, there's typically two ways we talk about this. We're either in the liquid phase or we're the vapor phase. This typically refers to what's coming in to the machine, whether it's coming out of the system as a liquid or a vapor. Sometimes it's a mix as well. Now, liquid, of course, has a greater density. It's heavier, greater density. Therefore, it speeds the process up. When we're talking about filling our tanks, we need to fill our tanks with liquid to properly fill them. If we try to fill that tank with vapor, it's going to get overpressurized. Typically, it's going to get hot. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. Now, one of the big key pieces with filling a tank is understanding a little bit about this tank. All right. So when we're talking about tank connections here, we've got two valves on our tanks. One's liquid, one's vapor. They do not always follow the color coding. On this tank, the blue happens to be vapor and the red happens to be liquid. Not all tanks are made this way. Some of them are reversed. There's really no rule of thumb. So make sure when you're connecting up to a tank that you're reading the writing actually on these knobs that says liquid or vapor so that you know what valve you're putting things into. All right. Some of the other things in a tank, as you'll see here on the slide, inside that tank on the liquid side, we have a dip tube in this. That's so when this tank sets upright, we can get liquid out of the liquid valve. Oops, let's back up one more thing. One thing on that dip tube right here. That's a restriction. And we're going to talk about restrictions in here as well and kind of how to get some restrictions out of this so that we can flow into the tank quicker, get it out of the system and into the tank faster and keep it as liquid the entire time. The more we can keep this as liquid as we're moving it from the system into the tank, the faster we're going to get that tank filled up. Now, when we talk about tank filling, we need to understand some safety guidelines. We need to have safe PPE on when we're doing this. I'm not wearing any tonight because I don't have any live refrigerant in the tank or in my system connections over here because as you can see, they're not really hooked to anything. We're just using them to hook hoses up. Safety glasses, gloves, a lot of time good idea to have long sleeves on, maybe long pants, Sometimes a face shield, depending on what the area requires that you're working in. We also want to make sure that we're well ventilated so that we have fresh air coming in or you have a way out of the room quickly if you're in an enclosed space because if we have a sudden uh, release of refrigerant into a, an enclosed space, it's going to consume the oxygen in the space. Now this brings up another point. 
If we have this in the back of our truck and we're driving down the road and we suddenly hear something leaking in the back of our truck, one of the first things we need to think about is oxygen. If this starts releasing into the back of our truck or any tank that we carry in our back of our truck, typically it's not oxygen. So we need to realize as technicians, first thing we do if we hear something leaking in that truck, get the window down, make sure you got fresh air, then get off the side of the road and figure out what's going on, handle it safely. All right. Now, filling tanks. This was something that I found out about a few years back. I did filling tanks wrong for a lot of years, and a lot of the people that I talk to in the field still today don't necessarily understand filling tanks as we need to. Now again, this partially comes from guideline K as well as the DOT regulations. One of the first things we need to start with on tanks is up here on the collar, we need the water capacity, okay, which is WC, and we need the tear weight, which is TW on here. Now water capacity is how much water this tank can physically hold when it is 100% liquid full. And that's listed out in pounds and typically kilograms on these collars. Tear weight, of course, is the empty weight of that tank. How much does it weigh with nothing in it? It's just the tank materials. All right. As part of tonight's class, there's a download available. It is this sheet right here. One of the challenges with filling these tanks, we need to fill these tanks to 80% by volume. And one of the challenges with filling this tank is that water and refrigerant do not have the same liquid density. They're very different. If you look down this chart here, you can see on the bottom, water is listed, and you can see pounds per cubic foot density, and this is all listed at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, because 130 degrees Fahrenheit is where we need to be for the DOT regulations. So we need to calculate our fill at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. If that tank is going to be stored higher than 130 degrees Fahrenheit, you need to take your fill rate down to to 60% or 0.6 as you're, as you're going to see in the math here in a little bit. The next column over here is a fill multiplier. Now that fill multiplier of course is different for every refrigerant because the density is different. And the way we use this is we take the water capacity of the tank times the refrigerant multiplier times 0.8 which gives us our 80% that tells us how much refrigerant weight we can actually put in this tank. Once we add in the tear weight of the tank, we can get the maximum total tank weight. So that gives us easy ways to calculate how much refrigerant we can fit in the tank and what the total tank should weigh. Yes, we have a question already. Yeah, Eric, we got our first question. It's from Gus, and he asks, should tanks have lock caps, and are they required? Tanks have lock caps, not as far as I know. It is required now in a lot of building codes that the units have locking caps, but not the tanks. Now, that may be different in a specific locality or to your specific company. Uh, I could see that being a requirement. That's it? All right, let's move on. Great question, thank you. Now, <clears throat> one of the things with tanks, anytime we're filling them, anytime we're filling this tank, we need to have a scale under it. Something that I was shown and taught real early on is an easy way to go do a job, get up on a roof, whatever that may be. You weigh the tank down at the truck. How much is in it? We take the tank up on the roof or over to the job. We don't have to carry our scale with us now. And then I weigh it when it comes back. I found out the hard way with a friend of mine on a job one time that that's really not a good idea to do that. One of the challenges we have as technicians walking up onto a system is we don't know what's in that system. We know what the nameplate says on it, but we have no idea how much refrigerant is actually physically in the system until we pull it all out. We need to have a scale underneath that tank all the time 
watching that tank weight to make sure that we're not overfilling the tank because otherwise we can easily overfill that tank. If we overfill the tank, best case scenario is that there's a relief valve on the back of these valves. If you can see that, the red dot right here, okay, there's going to be a relief valve. Something that's a good idea to do when you're working in the field is keep that relief valve pointed away from you. That way you don't have it pointing at you if it does happen to, to relieve. As, you, as we know, refrigerant comes out rather cold and we really don't want that blowing directly on us. It's not comfortable. Best case scenario, if we overfill, we're going to blow that um, relief valve out. Worst case scenario, we end up with something like this. Okay, Thankfully nobody was hurting that one, but when that tank started out, my understanding is that it was on the other side of the wall and ended up on this side of the wall after the tank went. Okay, I don't know the whole story. I have several guesses about what actually happened. Um, based on what I see here and, and where the location was and I think the tank got too warm after it was overfilled. So again, this kind of stuff does happen. Yes sir, we have a question. Well, we did. We had a question for you to go back and restate that formula real quick for the guys. Okay, so this sheet right here is available on the download. This is, this is the downloadable sheet in here. So it's tank water capacity times the refrigerant multiplier for the individual refrigerant. So we need to make sure we get that refrigerant multiplier right. Times 0.8. Now, again, if you're going to store that tank over 130 degrees Fahrenheit, change that 0.8 to 0.6. And that's not a, that note is not on this sheet. I need to correct that on that sheet. Got another question. Cool. A couple questions coming in. So this one is, could the same size tank have the same tear weight as another of its size, or do they vary? They can vary somewhat. Typically, the tear weight on tanks is fairly similar. Um, I've seen some that are about a half a pound difference sometimes, but it's a good idea to always just do the calculations for the tank that you have. Is that it? Uh, we got another question from Doug. Doug says, do different refrigerants have different uh, evacuation times or does it even matter what refrigerant it is? Typically, it doesn't matter so much what refrigerant it is. It's going to matter what state we're moving it in, whether it's vapor or liquid. Liquid, of course, having a greater density is going to move faster. So we want to keep everything as liquid as possible as we're going through this. And I'm going to show you some different techniques to be able to do that. Good questions. Thank you. Anything else for right now? Not yet. Yeah, we have, we have a... Got one more. We got another one. We have a question from David, and he said, will the relief valve shut down when pressure is low? It uh, is supposed to. Okay. <laughs> it's supposed to. <laughs> it is supposed to shut down. I have heard of them not shutting down. I have seen one that did shut down um, after a while. Again, it's like any other mechanical device. They can fail. And sometimes they do fail. We would all be out of, out of work if mechanical devices didn't fail, right? So, that it? Uh, we, we have a, a snide remark from Mark. So Mark <laughs> says, so filling a recovery tank to 80% of water capacity is one of those old timer rules? Is it, is it something we really should follow? Well, we need to fill it to 80% by volume, okay, which water capacity is part of. And this is actually part of guideline K that we as technicians really missed in the field. There's another piece in guideline K that says we need, need to use the specific gravity of the refrigerant, which is essentially the same as the fill multiplier. The challenge is actually finding that information out in the field when it's necessary in a timely manner, which is why this sheet came to be. Okay, but great question, great comment, because yeah, that is, it was a big concern, and again, I didn't learn that. I learned we take the water capacity, we multiply it by 0.8, and that's where we fill it to. So, different things we learn as we go through the trade. I mean, not everybody knows everything. I'm still learning, everybody else in the trade is probably still learning too. We got a question from David. He says, so are there accessories to prevent overfilling of the tank? 
So the accessory to prevent the overfilling of the tank is the scale and you, the technician, doing your math properly and watching that scale. There used to be um, float switches inside the tanks and, and you'll see the tank still built with this tap up here on top. There used to be a float switch and that float switch would then turn the motor off on the machine. The challenge is that just because the motor's off doesn't mean the refrigerant wasn't still flowing into the tank. So under the right circumstances, it could still flow into the tank and end up overfilling the tank. Then if you warmed the tank up from that point, you ended up with the last or the, the slide that we looked at here, right? Or we ended up with a relief valve going off at some point. So the industry went away from that. We got rid of those um, float switches inside the tanks and they used to hook through a cable up to the recovery machine and just shut the recovery machine down. Um, I've heard some people ask about solenoid valves and things like that. Well, if you've worked with refrigeration and solenoid valves for very long, you know that they fail sometimes. To me, really the fail safe is us standing here monitoring this, which means we need to get it done in a timely fashion to make sure that everything is safe. I mean, we're transporting around a pressure vessel here that at times can have pretty severe forces coming out of it if, if we don't treat it with respect. Anytime we have pressure in something, we should always treat that system with the respect that it deserves. Good, got another one. Got All right. More. So uh, Ricardo, long time training uh, member guy that's been around for a long of these events. Uh, he asks, so that recovery tank, when new, was it under vacuum? Um, typically they do come under vacuum, not all the time though. Anytime you have an empty recovery tank, before you fill it, you should always pull a, a 500 micron vacuum on the tank to make sure there's no non-condensables in there. Um, if you're going to return that refrigerant back to the system, that you're working on. Of course, you don't want non-condensables in it. And if you're going to send it in for recycling, we really need it to be as pure as possible or you can actually get back charged if there's too many impurities or if there's mixed refrigerant, things like that in there because it has to be um, either destroyed or maybe do extra work to separate some of that out. We have a quick note from a, a friend of our training series, David Richardson, uh, just commented, said that's an awesome photo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Glad you're watching tonight. <laughs> and the last one for right now is um, from Mark. He asks, is it a good idea to put your recovery tank in a five-gallon bucket of ice water or on warm summer days to help speed up the process? Asking for a friend. Great question. <laughs> Let's watch and find out because I've got some tips on that. We'll talk about that. All right. Okay? That's it for now. All right. Onward we go. Now, Typically, we talk about recovery, direct recovery, either in the liquid or vapor phase, all right, which is what we have hooked up here. We're pulling out of the system. We're going into the machine, out of the machine, directly into the tank. Or we use a push-pull method, okay? And it's kind of hard to see on the screen, I think, with the tank. But the push-pull method takes the liquid directly from the system into the tank, and we use the machine to pull vapor off the tank and push vapor back into the system, which then pressurizes and pushes that liquid into the tank. So two different ways to do it. Typically with a push-pull, it's used on larger systems where we know we can access a large volume of liquid in the system and put it directly into the tank. Because once we get done with the liquid phase in the system on our push-pull, we have to reconfigure all of our hoses to do a direct recovery because we still have to pull all that vapor out of the system as well down to the EPA levels. All right, So there's some reconfiguration and some work, some extra work that has to be done when we're doing the push-pull. However, if you have a large volume of liquid this push-pull method works very, very well to get the tank filled up quickly and not overpressurize it because you're taking that vapor back out of the tank and you're putting the liquid into the tank to fill it up properly. So let's take a look at some other things that can cause us headaches as we go along. 
Couple of things that can really slow stuff down. Core depressors, right, in your hoses. Cores inside. You want to zoom in and take a look at this. Okay. So what we have here are two cutaways, right, of the uh, of cores. There we go. We can get a good good close-up shot of this. So we've got two core cutaways here. This one over here is closed, and this one right here is open only with a core depressor inside that fitting. And there's not a lot of difference if you look in there. It's a pretty large area reduction, and if you're moving liquid refrigerant through this fitting right here, that's going to actually act as a metering device in there. So it's going to lower that pressure and possibly cause flash gas going through the fitting. Makes a great metering device. It's great for when we're putting liquid into a system. But if we're taking liquid out of a system or even vapor out of a system, it slows us down quite a bit. We'd like to get jobs done a little bit quicker sometimes. So use a core tool on this. All right, so we need to use that core tool, pull that core out. We have a straight through connection on that core tool, hook our hose up on the back. We'll show that in a little bit. Some other restrictions we talked about are hose diameter, or a hose diameter, but fitting diameter as well. So we have two fittings here. You want to get a good tight shot of those. The one in this hand, okay, is off of a quarter inch hose. It's actually about an eighth inch diameter ID versus this is a three eighths hose and we're looking at about a little over a quarter inch diameter. As a matter of fact, I can slide that inside there. Again, fewer restrictions help us get things from point A to point B, keeping it, things in the liquid phase if at all possible. Um, during recovery, things like um, uh, your uh, no loss hoses, uh, any, even, even things like having a uh, core depressor in the end of the hose. Again, they're all restrictions in here that can slow things down. Bends in the hose. Try to get as many restrictions out as possible. Now, so that's some good restrictions. Core tools, okay, great thing. They come in different flavors, quarter, five sixteenths. Two different sizes Appian happens to carry. And we use them right here on our access points. Now, if you've never used a core tool before, we're going to start building this. Again, like I said, this is kind of a standard setup that I see a lot of people use in the field. We've got a manifold hooked up to our unit, feeding directly into the recovery machine, coming out of the recovery machine with a hose into our liquid side. Sometimes we put it in a vapor. It depends. A lot of people say it depends on what they were taught. If you've never used the core tool before, put it on. You want to use one hand to push in and seat the stem. Keep that finger pushing in and rotate the core out until you hear and or feel the click. And what that is is the last thread in there. Then you want to let it come back slowly, okay? There's going to be pressure normally pushing that out. So close the valve to isolate your pressure, unscrew it, and you should end up with a core. Now in this case, we didn't end up with a core, which probably means that I over tightened this fitting on the back side of here, okay? What happens if we over tighten this fitting, we end up constricting the O-ring inside of this and it, it actually closes the center diameter and it will pull the core off as we pull that through. And as uh, technicians are um, fond of doing, we love to get things tight, right? Because tighter is better. So we loosen that up about a quarter turn and let's see, hey, that time we got a core out. All right, so let's get that back out of the way. Now the other one, I'm going to put the core tool on here just to show you what the core tools do. They get rid of the core. Can you rotate that just a little bit? We can, we can see about rotating that just a little bit here so everybody can see a little bit better. That would probably be a great idea. Let's see. 
that help everybody? Okay. The core tools get us a nice flow through here, nice straight through flow, as well as give us immediate control. So it's, it's quarter turn, real fast control of anything going in or out of that system. And that's going to be important here in a little bit. So then you would use your manifold coming back right here. This is going to feed a lot more refrigerant into your recovery tank or into your recovery machine, which is going to cause it to push a lot more out of, your, out of the machine into the tank faster. All right. Couple things. Remember those dip tubes in here? Okay, now this is a tank cooling trick. Those dip tubes in here, if we're pushing liquid in, we've got to push it all the way through that dip tube, another restriction, to get it down to the bottom of the tank. Versus if we put it in the vapor port, it just goes in right here. If we're pushing it into that tank, let's get rid of all the restrictions we possibly can hook that on the vapor port, and when we're putting liquid in the tank, we're going to flip it upside down. We're going to use our scale at this point. Our scale, again, is a very important tool. Keeps us from overfilling the tank. However, because of the difference in density between liquid and vapor, as we're filling the tank, we're going to see the values on that scale climb, 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 and then they're going to taper off and they're going to slow down. When it makes that switch to tapering off and slowing down, that's when you know you've changed from liquid going into the tank to vapor going into the tank. At that point, once we're putting vapor in, then we want to flip that tank back upright and we want to fill the vapor in on top of it. A lot of times we need to put, we, we end up putting our tanks into uh, water or ice or something like that to be able to help cool this tank down. Well, the reason we're doing that is because we're pushing too much vapor into a tank and this, in, in order to take vapor back to a liquid, we have to condense it. And unfortunately, this tank is really not designed as much of a condenser. It's designed just to store refrigerant to be able to transport it down the road or to another unit, whatever. So poor condenser we need water or ice or something like that to condense it. If we put liquid in there, it will heat up a lot less. Now, I've used this technique uh, in the Midwest where I'm located at, good success. I had a gentleman come up to me recently from Louisiana and say that he used this same technique of tank flipping on rooftop units in South Louisiana, and he, he could get his tanks full without having to cool them down with water or ice. So to me, yeah, if you're in the summertime, this is a really valuable trick to be able to flip that tank upside down. You have to be able to get the liquid refrigerant out of the system. Keep it liquid throughout, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some other things to be able to do that. Okay, so we'll leave that sitting upside down right there. Again, when it's liquid, upside down, hook it to the vapor port, fill it up. Once it switches to vapor, flip the tank back upright set the vapor in on top of it. I have used, as far as cooling the tank a little bit, once I start getting my vapor in there, the most tank cooling that I have done is actually just some rags and a spray bottle some, to uh, spray some wet rags down on the tank as it's sitting there. So that's, that makes it a lot easier and quicker for me when I'm out doing recovery jobs because I'm not having to deal with hoses or water buckets or ice baths or anything else like that at that point. Questions, ready? sir. Yes. Ready some questions. I'm ready for some questions. All right. So uh, our first question is from Lee. He says, "How often do you uh, do the tanks need to be recertified?" Five years from the manufacture date is its first certification, and every five years after that. And I believe, if I recall correctly, there may be a 10-year maximum life on the tanks now. But yes, there's a manufacture date on every tank, and then there should be recertification dates. If that tank is out of certification, you're not allowed to fill the tank. 
If the tank was filled before it left certification, you need to take it in, get it emptied, and get it certified somehow. Good question. This question comes in from Michael. He asks, is it bad slash risky to have my bottle rack right behind slash next to me in my cab of my van? It kind of depends on what you consider risky. Um, I, if I had to choose to drive a truck, I would drive a truck today with a disconnected cargo and passenger compartment because of things like this. Um, but I realize that a lot of us don't drive trucks like that out in the field as well. So I would probably put it as far away from me as possible uh, wherever I'm storing any kind of tank uh, in a truck because I, I want to be able to hear that and not have that gas close to me and it does take time for the gas to transfer you know, through a truck to where the driver is at. Next question again is from Ricardo. He has, should there be a receiver in a push-pull recovery? A receiver in a push-pull recovery. The receiver in that case is actually the um, tank right here. So we're, we're going to take the liquid into it and pull the vapor off of it. If you're talking about inside the system, yes, that's a great place to pull liquid from is if you have access to a receiver, right, you can pull the liquid directly out of that as long as there's a liquid port on it. Our next uh, question slash comment says, before using a new recovery tank, should you always put a, a micro-ohm gauge on it to make sure it's in vacuum? If it's a new one, yes, I would absolutely measure the, the vacuum in it, and I would just automatically, because I've never seen one come from a distributor or from a reclaimer where it's in a complete good vacuum. They put, typically, they put enough vacuum on it uh, just with a recovery machine which is not a deep vacuum that we can perform with an actual vacuum pump. Um, keep going, I'm, I'll get... Okay, we got, we'll, he's going to get some more here going in a little bit. Now, so we talked about tank flipping. All right. Now let's take a look at our um, recovery connections, right? The techniques that we're actually using to make this connection. So one thing you're going to see here in this diagram, if you're looking, at, looking online, I don't have a filter dryer on here, right? I really need to have a filter dryer in front of any recovery machine. Now I know I'm showing Appion up here because I work with Appion uh, through the company that I work for a lot, but any recovery machine. You need to have a filter dryer in front of it. And the reason being the filter dryer is there to protect that machine from particulates getting into it. Right? It's rough on these machines. So we got a close-up here of this. This is actually out of one of the, the Appian G5s. Um, this is the end of a piston where it uh, got some particulate in there and the story that I got was the gentleman was running it and his filter dryer kept plugging up. So what do we do when the filter dryer plugs up? We take the filter dryer out, right? That, that's, that's logical. So he trashed a, uh, a recovery machine that, that day because of that, uh, which gets kind of expensive. So filter dryers are pretty inexpensive. Let's go ahead and put a filter dryer in front of this machine. Now we're also going to use a large 3 8 diameter hose with large diameter connectors on the ends of it to make that connection. And that will become important later on here as well. Okay. So, got our filter dryer in front of this. Now, one of the next things we should really do is replace our outlet hose on the machine. Uh, it is especially important on the G5s, but I, I can see where a lot of machines would benefit from this. We want to run as short as possible, typically a four foot 3 8 hose on the outlet side. It's hard to screw things on when you're standing behind a machine. And again, run that into the vapor connection on our tank. Now that's going to lessen the restriction between the outlet of the machine and the tank, which again speeds things up and keeps things in liquid state as it's going into the tank. 
The more we keep it as liquid, the faster everything's going to get done. Doesn't work too good when you're uh, at the wrong angle here. This is what happens in live training. You get to actually see all the screw ups. <laughs> there we go. So, again, that 3 8 hose, the larger fittings, straight fittings, really great idea to have between your machine and your tank. Yes, I have sir. A pertinent question, really quick, from Anthony. So yes. he asked, so why do you actually turn the tank upside down when connecting the liquid into a vapor side of the tank? So, if we go back to this, okay, if we're sitting upright and we're going to push liquid in in that liquid fitting, we're pushing through that dip tube, and that dip tube's a small diameter. It's more resistance to flow. We're trying to get rid of as much resistance as possible here because added resistance starts stacking up. Each one of these things is a piece that you can do to reduce resistance to get the tank filled up with liquid just a little bit quicker. When you start adding them all up, it can make a big difference on recovery time. So if we go in that vapor port, and the tank is upside down, we're going to fill that tank from the bottom up with liquid. Once we get to that vapor state, then we flip the tank back upright. Anything else right now? Um, yeah, I have okay. a question from Bruce. It says, what will, uh, what will it, the issue be if you let the vapor raise, uh, rise through the liquid? So if you let the vapor come up through the liquid, that's a great question, and it's one that I played with a little bit. And what I found is that if I keep bubbling that vapor up through the liquid, I'm actually causing some of that liquid to, to flash up to vapor, and it's because it's sitting there disturbing it in the tank. So by flipping it back upright, I'm not bubbling that up through there. Great question, though, and great observation. This question comes from Alex. Is it okay to use the same recovery tank for more than one refrigerant type? You can use the recovery tank for more than one refrigerant type as long as you remove all of that refrigerant. So say if you start out with R22 in the tank, you want to take it back, have all the refrigerant taken out of it, pull it into a vacuum, and then you can use it for any other type you want to. Now, one thing you do need to be aware of though is just pulling a vacuum on this tank while that will remove the refrigerant. It'll remove the, the oil, or it will remove um, refrigerant, water, things like that. It will not remove oil from the tank. So if you get a bunch of oil sitting in this tank, say you had a burnout on a system, you might pump a whole bunch of refrigerant in there and burned oil from the system, but you're never going to get that oil back out of there. So that is a cautionary piece when you're using refrigerant over on systems, is just pulling that vacuum on the tank does not actually clean the tank out from contaminated oil or anything like that that's sitting in that tank. Next question is from Matthew. He said, wouldn't the filter dryer on a recovery machine create a restriction? Yes, it does create a small restriction. And this is a question I do get sometimes is, how often should I change that filter dryer? Well, the answer is, how often does it get dirty? Okay. It does create a small restriction there, but it's also necessary to protect the machine because if we're not protecting the machine, the machine breaks down, then we can't really do anything at all. Typically, the filter dryers don't cause a huge restriction, and if you get a larger filter dryer, I typically like the largest quarter inch filter dryer that I can find. This one happens to be a small one. It's just easier for me to carry around a lot. Hopefully that answers the question. I got a question from Michael. So he asked, so what do you do with a dirty tank? What do I do with a dirty tank? Use it to put dirty refrigerant in, send it back. Um, and even about the only time you're really gonna get a tank clean is when they take it in and do a recertification on it. At that point, they're going to clean it out. They're going to inspect the whole inside of it, and they're going to reseat the um, valve back into the tank. But other than that, those tanks don't get cleaned out. 
Uh, it, it's something that happens in the industry. I mean, even this tank, when I bought it brand new, I've never had any refrigerant in this tank, but I can roll that tank around and there's actually a piece of weld slag that came off the weld in here rolling around inside that tank that I can hear in there. Again, an interesting question from Harold. So he asks, is there any way to know if you, the tank you receive from a supply house is absolutely clean? We're told they are, but how can you be certain? No, nope, no way to know for sure. Not unless you're going to pull that valve out and put a camera down in there and do a full inspection on it. And I really don't recommend doing that on every tank. Okay. And then my last question would be, so what would be the downside of having a filter dryer on the outside of the recovery machine be other than that the machine would get dirty? So the machine's going to get dirty, which is really what we want to, to stop. This filter dryer is not here to clean the refrigerant up. Even in an operating refrigerant system, a filter dryer needs multiple passes to get that refrigerant cleaned up as it's circulating around in there. This is only here to keep particulate matter out of the machine. Uh, there's a lot larger filters, a lot more filtering involved to get refrigerant cleaned back up to the AHRI 700 purity standard, which is what all refrigerant, new or reclaimed, has to be cleaned up to before it gets sold back onto the market. That's good for now. Okay, sounds good. Moving on. All right. So couple things on there that we can do, right? We can add this, this larger hose in, add that filter dryer in there, okay? Now, this is another common piece that I see. Rather than using this hose, we use what's called a um, cooler, a subcooler, right? Couple challenges with this. This actually works pretty good if you want to cool the refrigerant down. And what happens is we hook this hose or the, the subcooler in between the recovery machine and the tank. We would hook it up to these two locations. We would then submerge this in a bucket of water, in a bucket of ice water, um, maybe run a hose over it if we didn't have buckets, something like that. And that cools the refrigerant down. It takes it, if there's any vapor refrigerant coming out of here, it takes that heat out of the refrigerant, cools it down, really turns it into a colder liquid before it goes into the tank. And that can work really well. Um, I've used it myself. The challenge, however, that I came up with on this um, after using it a while is that because it's on the outlet side of the recovery machine, a purge cycle won't empty that out. A purge cycle in a recovery machine, if it has one or if it's required to have one, empties the compressor cavity inside the machine. It doesn't do anything with the discharge line. It can't, right, because it still has to push that refrigerant out of there. So with this, there's a quite a bit of liquid refrigerant held inside that copper coil that's in there. So when we're done recovering with this, somewhat similar to what happens with push-pull, we then need to valve off the ends of these hoses or valve this off somehow and recover all of the liquid refrigerant that's sitting in these hoses and in this coil in here. So then we have to make a reconfiguration, right? And we need to recover all that refrigerant and put that into the tank as well because this is technically beyond de minimis for a recovery machine, allowable, right? So that's another method. And you can use the tank flipping method with that as well, okay? Um, and this shows what you've got to do. So after you're done, right with, whoops, I'm going too far. After you're done with this, then we have to reconfigure, pull all that out and push it into the, the recovery machine. All right, now, the next step beyond this, we've got our valve cores in here. This gives us good control of it. We've got our filter dryer, our large hose here, large hose coming out. The next step that we can take is to increase our hose sizes in between the filter dryer and the valve core tools. So let's lay our, our trusty old manifold here off to the side. We'll get that out of the way. And we're going to add in 
something else. So we're going to use a Y fitting. There's several different ways to do this. This is a really nice, uh, easy method to do it. Um, I really like this as far as a, uh, a field serviceable method. The other thing this does is it keeps um, dedicated recovery hoses. So when I'm working with um, nasty refrigerant, something like that, that I don't want to have getting into my next system, I've got dedicated recovery hoses for this. So what I'm going to do is hook it up like this. Now I've got the highest flow possible. All my control is right here at the system with my valves. To monitor that system for pressure, I'm going to connect up a, uh, a pressure gauge if your port's bent because it got dropped once. Things don't line up so good. I'm going to connect a pressure gauge to the side port on this core tool right here. Okay, That allows me to monitor the pressure in the system as I'm doing my recovery so that when I hit the EPA designated pressure in that system, then I'm all finished up. At that point, then I can isolate my system right here with these valves. Okay, I can disconnect it and I'm going on. Now, something I didn't talk about, I'm actually kind of surprised nobody's, nobody's mentioned this on chat, is purging. Okay, before we start a recovery, we need to purge all of our hoses. We need to get all the air out of our hoses, out of the machine, all the way up to our recovery tank. There's a couple different ways to do that. The way that I was taught was pressurize everything, and then you come over here and loosen this fitting at the tank and bleed it off. And that's one way. It does, however, lead to burned fingers if you're not careful, because you're trying to loosen the fitting here, you got refrigerant coming out, oftentimes sometimes it gets the liquid and you're trying to tighten it back up at the last minute. So, what I like to do when I purge a system, have both my valves open here, inlet valve on the machine open, outlet valve closed. Starting out. Then, I'm going to slowly, slowly, aiming this hose away from my face if it had refrigerant in it, slowly open that inlet valve until I hear a little bit of refrigerant coming out of this hose. At that point in time, I might open it just a little bit farther and I'm going to continue to let that purge. That's going to force all the air out of there. I may close this down just a little bit. I still want a gentle purge coming out of there at the very end. And then as that's purging gently, I'm going to go screw it on my tank right here. It's a much, much safer way of purging refrigerant out of a tank and out of your, or out of the hoses and the machine without burning your fingers, which is nice because I have had one guy in a class who said he liked burned fingers, but I'm, I'm not sure, sure he was telling me the truth. But either way, I don't like burned fingers, and I'm going to guess most of you out there tonight don't like refrigerant burns on your fingers because, I mean, you're talking about, you know, minus 40, minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit coming out of that thing sometimes. It's not comfortable. Yes, sir, we have a question. We have a couple questions. All right. A uh, question from Mark says, can you go over again and tell us when the recovery has moved all the liquid and starts pulling vapor? How can you tell? How can I tell? Scale, right here, right? When you're watching your scale and it's filling, the numbers are going to climb really fast because that liquid is dense, has greater density than vapor. When the numbers start to slow down on the scale, it's climbing but it's not climbing as fast and you still have a little bit of pressure left in your system, but there's not enough vapor coming in for the machine to condense it. That's when you know you're in vapor and you flip your tank upright. Hopefully that answers that question. Here's an interesting one from Ryan. He asks, is it important to flip the tank in the direction that, that tightens the fittings? It's a very good observation. It can be, yes. Um, I flipped them both ways. I've only had one loosen up, but yes, that's a very good observation that rotating that tank in a direction that tightens the fittings is a very good idea. Thank you. 
Frank has an observation question. With a dirty tank, can you use flush to rinse out the tank? Does that work? Well, the problem is that there's not really anywhere to flush it to. All right, you could put it in there, but that's really not going to carry the oil out because it, it, with a line set, when you're flushing it, you're flushing it past something and you have a definite place to pull it out. With a tank, that valve actually sticks into the tank a little bit and even the, the um, vapor port sticks down into that tank. So it's not actually going to get everything out of there. There's no way to drain it out of there without pulling that valve out and then flushing it. Now, you know, I, I don't recommend really pulling that valve out and doing anything else with it. Anything else for now? You puzzling him over yeah, there, guys. Yeah, yeah. So Ricardo asks, uh, do you have those Y hoses for all refrigerants, or can does it matter? The the Y fittings on here, yes, that works for any refrigerant. Um, that's actually a piece that Appian makes um, for making those connections. All right. So there's a um, there's that Y fitting right there. Um, they also make a couple different sizes of that for um, vacuum as well. Chris. Chris asked a question about reusing refrigerants. So is it technically unsafe to reuse refrigerants since tanks might not be pure or clean? That's a call you have to make in the field. Um, it's, it's a chance that we do take. I've taken it myself. I've, re, I've reused refrigerant and I've been successful with it. Um, it. It's a chance you have to take, but it, again, it wasn't something that I ever thought about or was aware of until I've learned a little bit more about it recently. Uh, David asks, at what point do we move the hose from the vapor side or can we stay on the liquid port? On the tank, on the tank, um, David, if you can ask that again, if you're talking about on the tank or on the system, I think you're talking about on the tank. If you're talking on the tank, you want to stay on the vapor port all the time because we're putting liquid in when it's upside down and then we're going to flip it over and put vapor in on the top. And by flipping the tank, we're getting rid of the need for that dip tube in there so that we can fill the tank from the bottom up with liquid and the top down with vapor just by rotating the tank. So this question comes from Alex. So you're saying on the, the recovery machine, they don't actually indicate when you switch from liquid to vapor? No, the recovery machine does not indicate that. And you can tell whether you have liquid or vapor coming into the machine by looking at your pressures and your temperatures coming on the inlet side. Thing is, when it goes into the machine, it runs through the pump or the compressor inside the machine, and then it also runs through several coils in the machine, and we run air over those coils just like we do in a condenser to actually condense that refrigerant. We're trying to get it back to liquid as it's coming through. So even if we're pulling vapor in, we may be pushing liquid out which is why we use the scale to be able to tell what's going into the tank. Sean wants to know, does it matter which side you're checking the pressure on? Which side I'm checking the pressure on? Honestly, it doesn't matter. There's no specification on that. I prefer to do it on the vapor side or the suction port as close to the compressor as possible on most systems. And I'm talking about most single stage or single compressor systems because that's where the majority of my oil is going to be sitting. That's going to be the last of the refrigerant coming out is what's entrained in that oil. Good question. This question's from David. So what's your thoughts or can blends be re reused after recovery? Absolutely, yes. Blends can 100% be reused um, if you're talking about fractionation. Okay, now a lot of people are worried about fractionation of blends. Um, I also work with a refrigerant company uh, at times, and everything we've seen come back testing-wise, it's very, very difficult to actually fractionate a refrigerant out in the field. It, it has to be under a very specific set of circumstances. If that unit has been running at all, everything's mixed in there. The two molecules are, or the, the two different refrigerants are very well mixed, or three or four, however many is in the blend. They mix well, they stick together, they leak at the same rates, they don't actually separate with, with leaks like uh, we thought early on when we started hitting the blends in the, in the industry. Alex just sent another observation. Have you ever noticed a, a, a volume change 
when you're switching between liquid and, and vapor from the recovery machine? So a volume change from the recovery machine, no. Because the recovery machine is going to move the same volume through it. Now you're going to get a different density, okay? because you're talking about how much does that volume weigh. So when you're pushing vapor through, it's gonna have a different density and it's much more compressible um, than your liquid is. So the volume versus density uh, can be two different things there. Okay, and the next question is from Matthew. He asks, well, so will the dryer filter, uh, will the filter dryer get oil out of a refrigerant? No. The oil passes just like in a regular refrigeration system. This is just a normal refrigerant filter dryer, quarter inch flare male on both sides. It's going to let that oil just pass right through it. It's going to clean some of the dirt out of that oil, especially the big particulates as it passes through there. So the, oil, the, the big particulates is what we're worried about because that's what's going to get inside and screw your recovery machine up as it's going through there. Okay. That's it for now. That's it for now. All right. So, moving on. Now, mm, where were we at? Okay. So, I talked about purging, and that purging works for any type of setup. Make sure you understand your recovery machine. Make sure you know how your recovery machine works as you're doing that purging as well. Um, when we're finished with a cycle, um, there's oftentimes a, um, uh, the need to um, shut your machine down in a specific way, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but make sure you know and you understand how your machine needs to be shut down. Now, one thing I want to show you, and I'm going to show that it, it's specific to this G5, and I talk about it because there's a lot of these G5s out in the industry, and they're a really common machine, very popular, and, and deservedly so. They're a very good machine. It's what I used in the field, and now I get to talk about it a little bit. So always run the G5 with the valves wide open to make sure that you're getting good flow. If you start to modulate, I see a lot of people try to modulate the inlet valve when this machine starts jumping up and down. If you start seeing this machine jumping up and down or rattling or making a bunch of weird noises that it doesn't normally make, it's going to be because you have a discharge side restriction. That's where using this bigger hose really comes into play. And on a lot of machines, it'll just give you a lot better flow out of it. Okay. So don't modulate your inlet valve. You want that always open all the time. When we're done with a recovery, everything's finished. Low pressure on this side. We've got the valves closed over here. Okay, we're going to disconnect that inlet hose. And again, this is specific to the G5. The first thing you do on a G5 when you get done with a recovery is you turn this power off. Don't cycle any valves. I pull that hose off. The internal valves should be holding back and keeping that refrigerant in that machine. All right, um, we shouldn't have any issues. Now, once we get that done, we also want to turn our tank valve off. We're going to come over here, shut our tank valve off. Okay, then we're going to actually open this, and I don't have any pressure, but normally this would be under high pressure right here in, in this hose. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my inlet valve, I'm going to turn it to about 45 degrees. Right? There's a passageway at 45 degrees that opens up between the high and the low side and it will allow all the liquid refrigerant or all the refrigerant that's sitting in this hose to back bleed out here. That way you're not coming up here and having to unscrew hoses full of refrigerant and risking again burning, burning, burning our hands. That's not something we want to, want to do a whole lot of. What do you do with that refrigerant when it comes out? It just goes out on, into the air. That's called a de minimis release. Good question though. Yeah, that is an acceptable de minimis release because there's some, there's some cases where you, you're not going to get 100%. We, we're going to lose a little bit. We need to recover the vast majority of it, though, per the regulations. How are we doing on questions? Anything? Yeah, yeah, if we want to take right. some time. All right, let's take some questions. This one's from Ferris. If you misattach the hose, what would happen to the recovery machine, and is there any protection built into it? If I misattach the hose, 
I'm not quite certain what hose you're talking about, Ferris. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit more with another question? So this one, while we're waiting on Ferris to... So Bruce asks, are most recovery machines designed for moving liquid without uh, hurting the pumps? Most of them are not. Um, and it v depends on how the internals of the recovery machine is designed. The Appion, the G5 and the G1 from Appion are designed to handle straight liquid. So we don't have a throttle position or a liquid position on your inlet line. Most machines are, need to be throttled a little bit when you start putting straight liquid into them. So that's one difference between this machine and a lot of other machines out there on the market today. Next question is from Michael. Yes, is there any way to tell if you have a blend during the recovery process with today's recovery machines if the system wasn't marked properly? Hmm, not really. You need to do a refrigerant identification on that. And um, if somebody's mixed the refrigerant in there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, the most common one involves getting that refrigerant into a tank and then measuring the pressure and the temperature of the tank after it's stabilized to figure out what the refrigerant is. So you take that pressure and temperature, you compare it to a PT chart. A big challenge with that today is we have so many replacement refrigerants or refrigerants that are very, very similar with pressure and temperature that it is almost impossible to get a positive identification on a refrigerant without actually sending it through a refrigerant analyzer. Um, you can get the pressures and temperatures can be so close that you think you'll have one blend or maybe you'll think you have a single component refrigerant and you may have a mix of several different refrigerants. Very, very difficult to do that in today's world, unfortunately, with the number of refrigerants that we have on the market. I, I wish I had a better answer for you there, but not, not the greatest. Oh, thanks. Uh, next question is from Jonathan. He says, do you invert the tank on a push-pull method as well? No, I do not. On a push-pull method, I would leave it upright, and we'll show that here in a little bit. Okay. So, Juan asks, I need to change the oil every time uh, I use my recovery machine? So, recovery machine doesn't have any oil in it. Um, two different types of compressors in recovery machines. The G5 does not put the refrigerant oil through, because any oil that goes through this is coming out of the refrigerant system. The refrigerant oil in this only goes through the piston, the tops of the pistons and the cylinders. All right? In most recovery machines, they are typically, uh, of other brands, they're typically a compressor style where we actually run the refrigerant oil through the crankcase and then up through the heads and out. Cool. Next question is from Carlos. Yes. So when you start a vacuum, did you open the vapor and liquid lines at the same time? So when I start a recovery, typically I'll start with just the liquid line if I'm pretty sure there's liquid in there. Um, sometimes I'll open both. It depends on the size of the system. If I know there's liquid somewhere, now where does liquid set in a system? It goes to the coldest point. So wherever the coldest point of the system, that's where your liquid's going to pool. If I can find liquid in there, I'm going to go for the liquid first, and then I'll probably open both valves later on when I get a little bit more of that liquid out of there and then pull a mix in. The machine typically is going to do a pretty good job of condensing that back to a liquid as it goes through the machine and before going into the tank. Nice. Our next question is from Nicholas. It says, is it a good idea to use the system compressor to push liquid directly into the recovery tank before hooking up the recovery machine? You could do that. It's going to be a challenge. Um, I typically don't like to do that. And a lot of times when you're working on systems, of course, the compressor may or may not be running. But you're always going to have some circulating through that system. And it's probably going to be hard on that compressor a little bit when you're getting it running out of refrigerant because of the compressors are refrigerant cooled. So I prefer not to do that myself. Okay. Next question is from Joseph. So how much discharge pressure can the G5 build up to? So the G5 has a cutout pressure of 550 PSI. So it's 550 internal and that's calculated to be below the, the 400 limit on the tanks. 
Ben is asking, so do you need both valves at 45 angles, 45 degree angles to have the pass through from the pressure bleed off? No, only the inlet valve. That's your, that's your uh, pressure bleed off connection right there. Next is from Gus. Do you recommend a uh, outdoor, a desired outdoor temperature for proper recovery, like during the winter? You can pretty much do it any time of the year. Um, recovery in the winter is going to take a little bit longer from one sense because we're using pressure inside the system. We're using heat inside the system to build up pressure to push it out to the recovery machine. If I'm doing something in winter, um, especially where I know that I have a leak-free system. Now, if I have a leak in the system, I'm not going to pull the system pressure down below atmosphere because I don't want to pull atmosphere back into the system. But if I've got a, a leak-free system that I'm working on, I'm probably going to pull that down well below atmosphere even in the winter time because I can get more refrigerant out of it. Now, that being said, it's going to be really easy to keep the tank cool in the winter time because it's colder in the ambient temperature around that which is going to naturally help keep that tank cool. Next question is from Chris. He says, is it possible for oil to be still trapped in the G5 therefore contaminating the container if reusing the refrigerant? It's possible to have a little bit of oil in there and it's a good idea to go ahead and um, actually run a little bit of air through it and we put, you can actually put some oil in the inlet to help keep things lubricated in there, some clean oil. Uh, Ricardo asks, can you confirm that the G5 is only liquid, only recovery machine? Okay. Liquid and vapor both, yes. It will do either or. Okay. Yeah, then this question from Frank was, do they make dual recovery slash vacuum machines? Um, I have, I think there might be one company that put it out there, but they are such different internals that you actually have to have two separate um, pumps in the machine because a vacuum pump for deep vacuum that we need to hit um, versus a recovery machine uh, are very different pieces inside of that machine. So I think somebody might be making one in one box. I haven't used it. I haven't seen it. Next question is from David. He asks, do you have, have you ever had to warm a tank when recovering in the winter? Uh, warm a tank when recovering in the winter? No, because the lower I can keep that pressure, the better it pushes it in. Now, if I'm going the other way from the tank into the system in the winter time, yeah, I've had to warm a tank to get this, uh, maybe a virgin tank or a recovery tank putting refrigerant back into that system because I need to create a higher pressure in that tank. Cool. Michael asks, is there any minimum time you should allow for a system to recover? Mm, minimum time kind of depends on how long it takes you to hook up and um, uh, you know how much is in there. Um, there's not really a minimum time that I think it should take. No. All right. David asks, is there a is the push pull method preferred in cooler ambient temperatures? Um, not really. Push pull is more desirable when you have large volumes, and I'm going to say. I would use it probably 30 pounds of refrigerant or more um, coming out of a system just because of the extra time that it takes to, to make the conversion on your hoses. The other piece that you really have to think about is do I have access to liquid in the system? Um, so if I have access to, uh, to liquid like say in a, uh, um, a receiver or something like that where I can get that liquid out then it's a really useful tool. You guys are making him work hard over oh, here. Oh man, I'm, yeah. I'm impressed. He, he's got his thinking glasses on. <laughs> Fer Ferris asks us, uh, can we reuse a recovery refrigerant back to the system? Yeah, we kind of Recovered about. refrigerant, we, you can, yes. Um, again, depends on what was in that tank. It's kind of a judgment call that we have to make as field technicians about whether or not we should, we should reuse it. And that may be a conversation that you actually have with the customer weigh the pros and cons of it, knowing that inside that tank is an unknown to you. Um, what do you want to put back in their system? Cool. Ben asks, if you're using gauges to recover, how do you know when you're fully recovered? 
So if you're using gauges, you need to have a gauge monitoring the system pressure and you need to match that up to your EPA specified pressures. Uh, and that depends on what kind of a system you're working on as to what pressures. That's covered in EPA 608 guidelines. This one's from Alex. He's asking, on a residential five ton or less system, does it make sense to take the time to use the push pull and larger hoses? I'm gonna say larger hoses, yes, push pull, no, on that system, uh, residential style systems. No, I would, would not do that. I've tried it, it didn't save any time. It actually cost me more time. Val's gonna ask an interesting one here. Is it, is it best to have any solenoid operated valves energizing to recover? So if you're recovering a system with solenoids in it, so the refrigerant system has solenoids out there in it, yes, you want to have those either energized or you want to get one of the magnet attachments where you, you pull the, um, um, uh, the electromagnet off the top of it and you permanently open that valve if it's a normally closed valve. It's a good idea to have those open because any Anytime you have that out there, you could be parking refrigerant or stopping refrigerant behind that solenoid valve. Emilio asks, to recover refrigerant on a chiller, what's a better method, keeping the pumps running or drain vessels? So that kind of depends on what kind of refrigerant is in the chiller. Um, you need to, and by pumps, I'm assuming he's meaning water circulating pumps. And yes, anytime you're doing a chiller, you need to have the water circulating pumps running because once you get down to a certain pressure, that refrigerant's gonna get below freezing point of the water in the barrel or, or in the uh, refrigerant to water heat exchanger. You risk freezing the water on the opposite side of that heat exchanger. So always keep your water circulating on a chiller when you're, when you're recovering it. Hudson asks, how often do you have to change the filter dryer? Great question. When it gets dirty. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, it's kind of a smart aleck answer, but it's the truth. I've seen some systems take three, four, five filter dryers to recover them. And then I've had filter dryers that have lasted me a year if I'm not hitting dirty systems with it. So it really depends. Um, my rule is if I start to see a frost line build on that filter dryer, that's when I need to replace it. And I've always got a, an extra one or two on my truck if I, if I need be, because let's face it, I mean, those filter dryers are pretty inexpensive. Ricardo asks, should those hose connectors to the inlet and outlet valves of the recovery machine have depressors? No. Those, you don't need, if you're using the core tools here, there should be no depressors anywhere in that entire system. They're another restriction to the refrigerant flow in that system. So get them out wherever you can. Uh, David asked, would it hurt to put a sight glass with a filter dryer? You could. Probably not going to do you a lot of good, though, as far as a sight glass is in there. It's another potential leak point and thing to deal with because you're looking at the refrigerant coming into the machine. You're not really looking at the refrigerant coming out of the machine. They keep coming in, man. You keep answering, okay. knocking them down. They keep coming keep, through. Keep bringing them. Yep. David then asks, uh, what would, would the same rule for the chiller pumps go for indoor blower motor circulator? Uh, it's not, it's not going to hurt to run your indoor blower while you're recovering because you're going to be adding heat to that coil and anytime you add heat to it, it's going to help push it out of the system. But it's not a requirement like it is on a chiller. Next question comes in. What's your thoughts on recovering flammable refrigerants? So flammable refrigerants are hydrocarbons and those right now are not recovered. They are just simply vented to the atmosphere because they are deemed to, to not be harmful. You need to vent them in a safe and well ventilated area so that they do not reach the lower explosive limit on the gas and uh, keep it to keep it from igniting. Okay. Bruce's question is, is it worth extra cost for the larger hoses to recover a residential five ton? Um, I think it probably is because if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and standing here watching that scale um, to make sure and I'll relate a story to you and this 
wasn't on a residential system, but I have seen it happen because I owned a house once that actually had double the amount of charge that the nameplate said. Um, <clears throat> and I went back and figured out that A, the filter was plugged up, and B, the person that was charging it was charging it trying to get the suction pressure up to a certain point, which, as we know, is not how we charge a system. So anything that can get me done quicker and onto the next segment of my job is going to be a benefit in my opinion. Um, and using the larger hoses, especially on the discharge side, is going to be a, a big benefit to me. Should you have, this question comes in from Matthew, should you have different fryer, uh, fryer filter dryers for different refrigerants? Not really necessary um, in this case, because in this case what we're worried about is just getting particulates out to protect the machine. Okay. Man, all right. you've done a great job. I'll let you keep on we going. We wrapped them up. Okay, so we're done with questions now. All right, so let's take a look real quick at push-pull and how that gets configured. Now, we're going to need some different hoses other than the red and blue ones that I'm showing here because these are all going to be quarter-inch connections. So I'm going to grab a couple hoses here. I've got them sitting over here. Sadly, I did not grab those and set them right next to me earlier because my brain was obviously not working correctly tonight or something. I don't know. It's been a long day. Anyway, so let's take a look at push-pull and we'll make those connections and I'll show you how that works. Okay, again, I'm going to use the same core tools. And when I'm working on a refrigerant system, guys, these core tools are on here all the time. I'm going to use them to pull my vacuum through. I'm going to keep them on there all the time because that allows me control over everything in that system. See, I've got them shut off right now. I can't get anything in or out of that system. There's no atmosphere going to enter into it. Nothing's going to come out of it. It's going to stay a lot cleaner that way. Okay. So let's take a look at these. and set this up. Now, we're going to flip our tank upright. So this is going to be just a little bit different than what we had before in that the vapor coming out of the tank is going to go to the inlet side of our machine. We're still going to run the filter dryer on there because I'm not going to risk putting um, particulates into that machine. You know, those machines are not inexpensive to purchase. Outlet of the machine, remember we're going to push vapor out of the machine and into the system. So we need to take the outlet of the machine and we would put that into some place on the system where there's vapor. At this point, I'm not going to be too concerned about having a pressure gauge on here because I'm not recovering it all the way down and I know that I'm not going to do that. I know that I'm not going to do that because I can't get all the vapor out of the system because I'm using vapor to pressurize the system and push that refrigerant into the tank. And then this is our liquid hose going over into the liquid port on the tank. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and leave that lick, this tank upright because I need to be on both connections. Okay, My liquid going in, vapor coming out. So the vapor comes out, gets pumped in, pressurizes the system, and pushes the liquid back into the tank. All right? We're going to run both valves open at that point. So just like this shows, discharge pushes, Liquid goes into the tank, depressurizes that tank by pulling the vapor out of it and pushing it into the system. Right? So that's push-pull. Again, this is used on larger systems. I'm going to say you got to have access to liquid. My rule is typically 30 pounds or more of refrigerant. Otherwise, it's really not worth the time to set this up, do this, and then switch back over and do the uh, vapor recovery.
Okay. Now, if you happen to have to do multiple tanks, okay, so maybe you've got 80 pounds or 100 pounds in a system. Again, this is going to be more for the commercial guys or the, the uh, guys doing larger systems. You can use these core tools as a valve, and you might want to put a valve right here on the end of each one of these hoses. That way, you can isolate that hose, turn it off, swap both hoses over to the next tank, and keep on going without having to necessarily purge your entire system every time you swap to a different tank. Okay, so that's another useful item for the valves here. That way you can do multiple tanks as you're rolling along. Now, again, there's a lot of different kinds of recovery machines out there. I do happen to know the Appian rather well because I've used it a lot and I've also uh, worked with it a lot after using it in the field. But make sure whatever type of recovery machine you are using, you understand how it works. Know what your connection system is going to be. Have a plan as you go in. So know what you're going to do. Have the necessary pieces to do what you want to do. Know how it works. Know what the procedures are for starting the machines, for stopping the machines as you're going along and you're working with them. Um, that will help you out a lot as you're working in the field. Again, we need to do things sometimes quicker uh, as we're having a technician shortage in the field. Obviously, with the virus going around right now, things are a little bit different. But we do have a technician shortage in the field for the amount of equipment that we have out there to work on, even if we can't get out and, and sometimes work on it right now. So getting things done a little bit quicker can actually help with that. We get a process done faster, we may be able to save 15, 20, 30 minutes sometimes depending on how much um, work we're doing and what size of a system we're working on. We start stacking up that time, we may be able to get on and do another job for another customer, which means is a benefit to us. So, any other questions? Oh yeah, you ready? All right, fire yeah. away. All right, here we go. Dave wants to know, can you show us how to use those screens that are taped to the front of that recovery machine? Good question, Dave. Yes, I can. Okay, so that is in, those screens are in the inlet. All right, so let's get this hose unhooked here. All right. These screens in the inlet valve are there to protect the machine in case the filter dryer comes apart. Now, they're going to be located inside this fitting right here. So down inside that fitting is, is where you're going to find that screen at. And we send replacement screens um, with it so that you have the option, if you need to, to replace that screen at some point if it gets damaged or if it gets filled up with junk. Um, I was helping a contractor one time and uh, we started noticing frost building up right here on this fitting. And I said, hi, ah, hey, guess what? I know what the problem is. And sure enough, I mean, they had a bunch of junk just sitting right in that screen. Now, again, that screen's not designed to capture as much as a filter dryer is. It'll capture some of it. It'll capture big stuff, but you're still going to get fine particulate through it into your um, machine and that machine's got pistons and rings and things like that and valves in there uh, kind of similar to what a car does um, it's kind of a cross between a car and a uh, refrigerant compressor and when you get that in there it starts to wear on those parts and it wears it out prematurely next question is from Ferris are those recovery machines multi-voltage or just 120 volts 120 volts Good question, though. Easy answer? Yep, easy answer. Alex asks, how much of a vacuum will the Appian machine pull? It will achieve the EPA required vacuum for the refrigerants it's listed for. I don't know what that exact number is off the top of my head, unfortunately. It's a good question. But I know that it because it's rated for certain refrigerants, it will achieve the the, the required vacuum for those refrigerants and for those system types. Lee asks, with a large split system on commercial 
condenser up on the roof, could you pull off the coil port versus the condenser port? You can pull off any ports you want to in the system. Again, getting the valve cores and things out helps a lot. But yeah, anywhere in the system that you want to pull off of um, is, is perfectly acceptable. So Chris asks, we're talking about recovery, but is it better to use a quarter inch hose when vacuuming down as well? Uh, it's better to use larger hoses when vacuuming down for lower resistance. Uh, it'll speed things up considerably. Alex is also asking, can you show us how to purge the setup? How to purge the setup. So we're, when we're talking about the setup, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Alex to respond to this again, which setup are we talking about? Because we did talk about purging our standard. Are we talking about purging the push-pull method right here? Most likely the push-pull. It was a recent question. Okay, okay. So let's talk about push-pull. So with push-pull, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use the machine or the, the refrigerant out of the um, system to do the purge. So you're going to purge up to the tank Okay, then once you purge up to the tank, I'm gonna have this side, yes, so this is my, let me connect everything back up here. So we follow the path of the refrigerant. We're gonna bring liquid out, okay? I'm gonna open this valve up. I'm gonna purge in a similar manner to what I did before. I'm gonna open this up a little bit with my hose out, right? Let a little bit of purge out here. Then I'm gonna make this connection point. This tank should be in a complete vacuum at this point. Once I get that hose purged, both tank valves are gonna be closed. So now I'm gonna open up the liquid and I'm going to start filling that tank because the pressure in the system is higher. So I'm going to open the liquid. I'm going to open my access valve here on my core tool fully, start filling the tank. Once I get some positive pressure in the tank, then I'm going to open the other side. And I'm also going to have both valves open on here. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to purge my vapor out at this point. You could close the outlet valve to give that better control as well. Just like I showed you before, close that outlet valve a little bit, crack it part way open, purge it, make this connection right here. Okay, that tank's still gonna be filling because it was a lower pressure, the liquid's gonna be going into the tank, naturally. Then I'm gonna open this fully. I'm gonna go ahead and open this valve up and start the machine at about the same time. And then it will start pumping and that's how you purge that whole circle. Hopefully that answered your question. I'll let you know if he okay. says otherwise. Sounds good. Jason says, the smaller tanks can be inverted for faster recovery. What's your advice for using a 100 pound tank? Leave it upright. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you... want to try flipping that? <laughs> no, you probably don't want to try flipping that because it does not have a collar on it. Normally your 100 pounders don't have collars on them. I've seen maybe one or two that do, but most of them just have the screw on cap. So when you're in those type of tanks, you just have to leave them upright unless you have a special forklift or something there that can flip it upside down. <laughs> but yeah, most people aren't gonna have that. You don't carry that on your truck? No, I, I don't carry it on my truck. I don't know, maybe maybe Jason does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David asks, can you wash or, or blow out the screens? Um, on the, the inlet screens, you can clean that out. Yeah, uh, most of the time what I'll do is I'll actually take them out um, maybe use a little compressed air um, or even my pocket screwdriver and just kind of scrape them off and knock, knock stuff off of there. Yeah, you can clean them out. But sometimes it, they get stuff so stuck in them that it's not worth cleaning that little tiny screen out. You throw it away and they think there's five spares that come with it and you can always order more if you need them. Okay. Question from Emilio. Can I replace a recovery tank valve if it's leaking? Um, you typically need to send that back and let the recovery company do, or the tank company do that, whoever you send your tanks in through. Um, if you go through a distributor, mark it as a leaker. 
because these actually typically do take a specialty wrench to actually get in there because you've got this collar around everything um, and if it's leaking they need to fix it anyhow because they were probably the ones that put it in there in the first place okay david asks then do you ever uh, evacuate the recover machine I don't typically evacuate a recovery machine, no, because I, I leave the valves open on it all the time. That way that if it's closed up and it's getting hot, pressure can actually build up in there and it can build up real high because there's a low volume on the inside of it. So I'll leave my valves wide open, maybe even uh, open slightly to a 45. Um, and maybe sometimes if I'm in a dusty place, I'll put dust caps on them, but I don't put tight sealing caps on there again so that that machine has uh, room to breathe. Everything else is done through purging when you purge the system out. Ricardo asks, in a heat pump, do you ever use true suction line or just the regular suction line in recovery refrigerant? You can use either one. Um, I would probably use the um, regular access port, not the true suction port, because most of those true suction ports have a really, really small diameter tube that hooks in between the compressor and the reversing valve and then brings that pressure out. It's a good port for taking pressure readings as well as taking a um, pressure under a vacuum or a vacuum reading. Um, while you're pulling a vacuum, it's not typically great for moving a lot of uh, large volume of refrigerant through that. Next question is from Bruce. He says, does it matter if you use vacuum rated hoses or not? Uh, when you're pulling a vacuum, yeah, it does. Uh, you should use a vacuum rated hose. When you're doing recovery, no, it's not going to make any difference. All right. That's uh, the vast majority of my questions at this time. All right. Well, guys, that's getting pretty close to the end of what I have for you tonight here. We have gone through uh, uh, quite a bit of information and some really good questions here tonight. So um, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to say thank you to everybody. And watch, now you're going to flood him with questions. <laughs>